and um, Dalit. So don't right. live stream yet because I, I okay, haven't downloaded it. Okay, if you can say that, you can. Okay, okay. Yeah, bye. Bye bye. Sorry, Dalit. I still have some problem. I can't download the text that I need because you asked me to go over everything and um, somehow I can't do it. Um, I don't know what's going on. You don't mean the text that you sent for us? No, I have that one, but I wanted to go through the introduction part and I just can't, I can't download it. I've got some problems with my connection. One moment, I will see if I have it in the... Uh, I need the introductory the first chapter. Part. Just a moment. I'm still looking for it. Uh, I will show you just one moment. Uh, speaker. It's Should called I the introduction. Uh, I missed that part of the introduction. You mean this one? Uh, no, that that part I have. That one I have. Not this one. Not this one. The introduction with the verse of on homage. So I thought to just nice. quickly go over it, just to say a few words about that. Mm. Somehow my internet program doesn't my my. Email program doesn't work, so I send it to myself. HML, I put a download. link in the chat. I wonder if that's the one you're looking for. Oh, great. Let me just. Ah, is it, is it, this is in the drive, so it's okay. You can open it or you want me to open it? Okay, I'll try to open it. Is that the introduction? Oh, great. Oh, great. I'll have a look. Just one moment. I will do you a co host. Yes, you are the co-host now. Okay, but I've got Google Drive now, which it's it's I don't a know, DFI, how do I get there? It's a DFI Google Drive. If you just click on the link, it should take you to that PDF. Um ah, there is so many files. Yeah, there's so many. Uh, actually I lost picture now i can't see anyone anymore oh there yeah okay so if i click on that it takes me to google drive and yeah, i don't then, know what to then, do then then it's open all the files and you can choose which one it's the one that you want to work with ah i see oh i see i see all right so the file about the introduction intro oh here it is oh here it is great could improve. Oh, yeah, that's very good. Can you see the file? Can no. everyone see the file? No. Oh, you have to do share. Okay, no, no, yes. we'll do it later. We'll do it later. Yeah. It's okay. But anyway, that way I've got it. Great. Okay. Yeah, we can start. Sorry for that. Got it. Great. Okay, so let's start with the motivation and the prayer as usual. Can everyone hear me clearly? Okay, good. All right. So, we start as usual with some breathing. Let's do some breathing meditation for a few moments and then we set the motivation.
And to set the right kind of motivation, visualize first in the space in front of you. All the enlightened qualities. That we can attain that we can attain ourselves in the form of Buddha Shakyamuni. Who's of the same nature as your Lama? Seated in the full lotus posture. Radiating passion, wisdom. and guiding us on our spiritual journey. And then to remember why we're practicing the Dharma, for whom we're doing this. Visualize that you're surrounded by all sentient beings. Quietly seated around you. And then remember that one thing we have in common with all of them is that we want to be free from suffering, experience peace of mind. And that we all deserve to be happy. And then generate a sense of warmth towards sentient beings, a sense of closeness and effect and, and acceptance. Knowing that all their faults and limitations are temporary. And then allow for that affectionate love to turn into great compassion. That wishes for all sentient beings to be free from suffering and its causes. without losing your affection for all sentient beings. A 
but not just that you wish for them to be free from suffering, but that you wish to protect them from all their unwanted experiences and their causes. Which then gives way to a special altruistic attitude that is determined to do whatever we can to work towards helping sentient beings to overcome suffering and its causes. And since we can only accomplish this in an effective way if we become enlightened ourselves first, let's generate the mind of enlightenment that is determined to become a fully enlightened Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. And it's with this motivation that we continue to study Nagarjuna's fundamental wisdom. And then that's without losing this precious motivation, let's recite the prayers. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity and so forth, May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. All right. Great, so then let's continue with the text. That is, usually I talk a little bit about the Lamrim, but since I, oh, just a sec. Since uh, Dalit asked me to go over the material a little bit, like what we've covered so far, just to be reminded um, of the different verses. So I decided to just go through this quickly and then continue with the new material. Okay, so am I the co-host now? Yeah, okay. So I haven't done this for a while. Green screen, share screen, the battle. You see okay. down a green battle, share screen. So you can Ah, yes, that's right. I forgot. I forgot that part. That's right. I need to press the screen, uh, the share screen, right? Oh, yeah, here we go. Right. So let me go over the introduction a little bit. Uh, where is it? Oh, here. 
Can you see it? Can everyone see? Yes, but if you can do it bigger on the screen. Okay, I'll try. Hmm. Uh, it's okay, it's okay. Whoops. No, something else <laughs> came up. Okay, introductory part. Yeah, sorry, I don't. Okay, here it is. Okay. Yeah, sorry, it's slightly small. Yeah, and it doesn't work. I can't. It says I can't uh, open it. Hmm, what to do now? There was a problem loading more pages, it says. Yeshima, there's an arrow there where you can download it if you wanted to on your desktop and then share it from there. Oh, okay. I next could to download the, it next from... to the print icon. No, not that one. Oh. Okay. Oh, maybe one. The one next to the print icon, the printer on the other side of your screen. Here? No, no keep going the other way, all the way to the other side. Yeah, and go down below. And there's a print icon, and next to it is a little arrow going down. Uh, oh, here. Oh, here. Now yeah, I can see that it. One. Okay, yeah. great. Okay. Yeah, this is my problem today, downloading stuff. But, oh, it seems to work. Oh, great. Great. Oh, wonderful. Can you all see it? It's not yes. big. It's, it's big enough, it's, right? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you for that. All right. I mean, I'm not going to go over everything we did at the very beginning. I just want to go over the verse of homage. So if you've got the time, you could just read over it, read through the other material. But the part I'd like to, yeah. So this is really part of the text itself, which is the homage, the verse of homage, which His Holiness always recites at the very beginning of it, not always, but a lot of the times when His Holiness gives the teachings, he recites uh, these three, well, four, no, eight lines or these two verses. So Nagarjuna basically paying homage to the Buddha for teaching dependent arising. Uh, so, but the way he does so is by way of describing what are called the eight attributes, talking about phenomena being dependently arisen and therefore not inherently ceasing, not inherently arising and so forth. So those are important because these eight uh, Nagarjuna will also discuss throughout the verses as we go through the verses of this particular text. And he says basically a person who realizes these eight aspects. So eight types of emptiness, basically, that phenomena do not inherently rise, they do not inherently cease and so forth. Well, from the point of view of the mind of such a person from the point of view of directly realizing that well that mind from the vantage point of that mind there are no fabrications so their mind is free from fabrication and totally peaceful so to really attain peace lasting peace that is what we need to realize emptiness and here in particular with regard to these eight attributes which are a topic of debate that's why it's those eight. I mean, there are many different types of talking about, well, many different types of emptiness in the sense, the emptiness of a table, of the self and so forth. But these eight are spe specifically important because there's a lot of debate on them. So they're described as a bone of contention. And you may remember, so seizing and arising. This is the first illustration in terms of these eight attributes. So the phenomena conventionally, of course, arise. Impermanent phenomena, they arise first and then they cease, they get out of existence. But that is just on a conventional basis. So here you can see first phenomena arise while, this, this, for instance, at the moment, at the time of the seed, the sprout is arising at that time. So we would say this, this sprout hasn't arisen yet, but it arises during that time. And then when it has arisen, 
it was with seizes at the same time. It goes moment by moment. It seizes. It goes. It changes into something else and slowly moves towards its total cessation when it's no longer a sprout. So conventionally, that is totally the case. But ultimately, there's no rising. There's no seizing. <laughs> because ultimately, if it existed, well, it would be independent of anything else. Therefore, there's no ultimate. There's no inherent seizing and arising. There's no objective, if you like objective, independent, seizing and arising, although it appears to our mind as if there was this concrete arising, this concrete seizing. And then there's also no inherent, no objective annihilation and no uh, objective permanence. So here permanence is a little misleading. It's not permanence in the usual sense, but rather saying that when something comes into existence, it remains as a certain entity for some time. So here in this case, you have the you have the, the, the tree trunks, you have these trunks. So they remain as trunks for some time. And during that time, we conventionally would call them permanent, as in like they remain as these phenomena, as these entities. But at some point they they change into something totally different. In this case, they change into a a, a table someone makes a table of them <coughs> uses the wood to to uh, create a table so now it's no it's annihilated as being a trunk but it exists permanently as a table for some time it doesn't mean that it doesn't change moment by moment not in that sense that it's permanent no, but in the sense that it remains as this entity for a while, we call it a table for some time until eventually, well, in the case of this example, uh, it'll, it becomes firewood and it's no longer called that. So conventionally, we talk about something existing permanently for some time as a certain object and then being annihilate, annihilated, going out of existence. And then that new object that has arisen is permanent. It remains for some time. Although, of course, it changes moment by moment, but like I said, permanent in a slightly different sense and so forth. So all this is due to the fact we call it trunk for a while, we call, call it table for a while, and then we no longer call it table, we call it firewood and so forth. But that is just labeled, it's merely designated, it's merely labeled on the basis of many different parts, but it's not inherently that. So that's those are the next two attributes that are mentioned in the verse of homage or in the verses of homage. And then the next two attributes are coming and going. So someone coming, someone going. Uh, again, this will be discussed later on in more detail, but what does it mean to come to go? Well, it's mainly labeled on the basis of many different aspects, the direction, uh, my perspective, of course, from the perspective of the person here, well, then on the other side, this person is coming. For us, this person is going here likewise. So again, there's no inherent coming, no inherent going. It's all relative. It's all dependence on another phenomena that we talk about it. So conventionally, yes, but not ultimately. And then lastly, of the eight attributes, you have distinction and identity, which means Phenomena, some phenomena are distinct, are different from each other, and some phenomena are identical, identical with each other. So they're one with each other. Here yeah, the example is of a sunflower, or you can take anything else. If the say, the name, if, the, if what it refers to and its term are exactly the same, then we can say they're identical. Sunflower is identical with the sunflower. But if what it refers to is different, the name is different, the term is different, well, then we'd say they're different. That doesn't seem to be really, it doesn't seem to be a big deal. I mean, it's not difficult to understand that, but on a philosophical level, this distinction between phenomena being the same and different, just because they have a different name, for instance, is considered important and it'll, it'll, it'll come up again and again later on. But as I said, these eight, are discussed a lot. They're important from the philosophical point of view. And here Nagarjuna stresses that none of them exist inherently. So praising, therefore, a dependent arising. 
uh, by way of mentioning those eight, mentioning that they don't exist inherently. Uh, in that way, it's also introducing us to the text because it deals with what is arising, what is ceasing, and so forth. So that part, that's that's how much I wanted to say about the just about the introduction. Um, and then I'll continue with the first verse. So having discovered the, the homage, then as part of the first chapter, the actual chapter now starts after the homage. So the chapter is called Examination of Conditions. We'll talk more about causes and conditions. Actually, I put this in the footnote, but I might as well say it here. A cause and a condition are equivalent, are synonymous from a Buddhist point of view. But in some cases, the term cause is used. In some cases, the term condition is used. Well, you'll hear more about this. But here, using the term, using the word conditions, well, it refers equally to causes. In the sense that when we say phenomena are dependently arisen, the question that, well, the question in a sense, well, first of all, we talk about interdependence. Everything exists in dependence on other phenomena. When we say dependent on arising, it implies not only that phenomena arise in dependence on other phenomena, but also that they exist in dependence on other phenomena. That's implied. But of course, the first step would to analyze, would be to investigate, how do they arise? How does something come into existence? How does our body, how did our body come into existence? How did that arise? How does every moment, every new moment of our life arise? Now, when we say arising, in each moment, each moment presents a new situation. Every day is new. Every day is different. Maybe similar, but still different. So what is the cause? How does a cause give rise to a result? That is so important because if we want to experience happiness and peace of mind, we need to know about the causes, of course, and also about how they arise, not just on a conventional level, but also on an ultimate level. Okay. So anyway, the text goes right into how does something arise? And here it's focusing on impermanent phenomena, talking about rising from causes. So by implication, it's something impermanent, something that changes all the time. And what Nagarjuna tells us with these first four lines, careful, all these pictures here. Okay. So what he tells us is that, okay, so, of the eight, remember the eight attributes, actually it starts by saying phenomena do not inherently cease and they do not inherently arise. The order is reversed in the homage, in the, in the verses, in the two verses of homage. However, here the, the order is according to uh, their actual sequence. First something arises and then it goes out of existence. First it comes into existence, then it goes out of existence. So the first aspect therefore is arising. Okay, now if phenomena really existed the way they appear to us, I mean, I don't know whether you're aware, that's of course an important part of our investigation, getting a sense of how phenomena seem to exist from their own side, objectively, like this world, this concrete world over there, it exists totally independent of my mind. And I just happen to walk into this world. I happen to be born into this world and see it as it is. That's how it appears to us in every moment of our perceptions. And in most of the time, we also hold on to it. I mean, we never doubt these appearances. Phenomena seem to exist objectively over there. They seem to objectively arise. So they arise from a cause that seems to be inherently different from, from the result. But if that were the case, then, well, first of all, there are four possibilities, basically. If something arises, rises, it comes into existence, either arises, it arises from a cause, or it doesn't arise from a cause. Those two, those are the two options. If it arises from a cause, then that cause is either the same as itself, 
or different or both. No other possibility. But from a Buddhist point of view, that is all based on inherent existence. However, phenomena, well, first of all, don't arise from themselves. That's impossible. But they also don't arise from something different. And here different, of course, inherently different. They don't arise from both. And they certainly don't arise costlessly. So that is the first reasoning that Langajuna presents. It's the diamond sliver reasoning, saying if phenomena really were to arise in the way they appear to us, then those would be the four possibilities, but that doesn't make sense. So arising from itself. It's actually, well, usually when we learn about this, we learn about a particular philosophical school, the Samkhya school, who hold actually that phenomena arise from themselves. In that they, here in particular, the Samkhya school, who do not assert that there's a creator God, but there are two types of Samkhya schools, I, I should say. So there's the theistic and the non-theistic. The theistic Samkhya school, they also um, accept the creator God, but the non-theistics, well, they had the ancient, this is an ancient philosophical school. So in ancient times, they, they gave it a lot of thoughts. Where, they gave it a lot of thought. Where do phenomena come from? How do they arise? And so in that context, they came to the conclusion there must be some primal substance, that everything arises from this primal substance they call prakti or primal substance, and that everything is of the same nature, that the, the result is of the same nature as the cause, so that they're inseparably linked. However, that would mean if they're of the same nature, if something is of the same nature, they exist at the same time. So they're not saying, for instance, to take the sunflower again as an example, they're not saying that the sun that the sunflower exists, that the sunflower arises literally from the sunflower. They don't say that. But they say that the sunflower seed and the sunflower are actually of the same nature. They arise from that same primal substance and they're all of the same nature. And that by implication would mean that they exist at the same time, that at the time of the sunflower. At the time of the sunflower seed, sorry, the time of the sunflower seed, there should be a sunflower because they're they're at the same time. They they arise from the same prim, primal substance, and therefore here being the sunflower seed, the sunflower must be already there because they're of the same nature. And if something is of the same nature, they exist at the same time. The the existence of one is dependent on the existence of the other in such a way that if you don't have one, you can't have the other. So by implication, therefore, the Samkhyas would have to assert that somehow the sunflower is already uh, present in the sunflower seed. And I discussed this earlier on. I said, isn't there a sense for us as well when we look at a little seed and someone tells us, oh, there's going to grow an apple tree from that? Already a sense there's already some treeness in that little seed. Here, I'm not talking about like a philosophical view, but just an innate sense there's already something there. We may call it potential, but potential, it feels like a little bit more than that. There's really something already in there, which is why it's interesting that this view we may have is reflected in that uh, philosophical view, which, of course, from a Buddhist point of view, actually doesn't make sense doesn't make sense at all because if you have already the sunflower in the seed why would you why would you why would it give rise to a sunflower again i mean then there's no point it's pointless and that's the argument here so we went through it before um what's the point if it's already there that it rises again so maybe the stomachers would say well it's not manifestly there it still has to manifest but it's still there. It, it, it is there. And the, the purpose is defeated for a, a seed because the, the result is already there. Um, and so also the argument would be if at the time of the seed, the sunflower is already there, well, then even if the sunflower is now manifestly there, it would arise again and again because it doesn't matter whether the sunflower has arisen or not. This sunflower here has arisen or not. Um, 
in the sense that, well, there's a continuous arising of a sunflower because just the arising, just the existence of a sunflower does not stop the, the production of a new sunflower because it was already here and still it, it existed at the time of the seed and still another sunflower was created. So then a continuous creation would take place. And if the sunflower is created again and again and again, well, then the seed will be created again and again. And that's just absurd. Anyway, um, I don't want to go into it too much because it is a little bit difficult, the whole reasoning and everything. But if you read through it, hopefully um, you remember what we also discussed in class and hopefully that in itself makes sense. But anyway, that's not the main point we're interested in. We're mainly interested in that. If phenomena really exist the way they appear, and phenomena, although they appear to exist inherently, independently, and if then they either arise from itself, which of course we've seen doesn't make sense, then the other option would be they arise from something inherently different. But that is another problem. That is a problem um, that is considered, well, that, that is a problem in the sense, well, first of all, who's the philosophical school or who are the philosophical schools who assert that phenomena arise from something inherently different? Well, other than the Prasangika school, it's all the Buddhist philosophical schools. Of course, also the non-Buddhist schools, but here it's in particular, it's Buddhist schools who all of them assert that phenomena arise inherently from a cause or that the cause and the result are inherently different. Everything is, exists inherently. Everything exists objectively. That is our sense of reality. And it's interesting that of all the different philosophical schools, it's only the Prasangika school who doesn't assert that. It basically shows the Buddha taught all these different philosophical schools, but it's so difficult to really understand this that he first taught these schools in preparation to understanding the higher school. So it's really just the Prasangika school who would totally disagree with this. And of course, that's what we're studying. We're studying the Prasangika school. So according to the Prasangika school, if phenomena really existed in that way, that would be totally disconnected. There would be no connection between this seed. And it was totally different from the, from the, from the sunflower. It wasn't, if it wasn't merely labeled, if it existed in and of itself, the way it appears to our mind, then there would be no connection between the two. So they would be totally different. And that doesn't make any sense because the problem would be that, well, a cause and effect, the cause and effect would be unrelated. So then a, a result can arise from anything. From a, from a sunflower seed, you could have an apple tree, you could have a table rise from a sunflower seed. I mean, there's no relation between the two. Then what makes the sunflower seed the specific cause of a sunflower? Okay. All right. So I hope that is clear. And then, of course, arising from both. Um, it, well, we've already refuted of course, arising from itself, arising from something inherently different. So arising from both, the same refutation uh, applies. I mean, the individual refutations of those two, of course, refute arising from both. But it's still interesting that there are some schools who assert both. So the theistic Samkhya school, on one hand, they said that the seed and the, the sunflower, they're of one nature. So therefore, the sunflower basically arises from itself, from its own nature. But at the same time, Ishvara, God, uh, the creator God, the, 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 the Samkhya school asserts, describing him as Ishvara, the all-powerful one. So uh, at the same time, Ishvara is a separate entity, also part of the creation, part of the production of the sunflower, and that is inherently different. So it rises from itself and something inherently different. That's the assertion of the theistic Samkhya school. And then you also have the Jain school, who would say that um, a clay pot rises from itself because it arises from the clay. It's the same substance that that it consists of once it's a pot. Well, that same substance gives rise to it. So in a sense, it rises from itself because it arises from the same substance. That would be 
arise from its arising from itself and at the same time well it doesn't it doesn't arise as a as a as a vase as a pot without the the a potter for instance or the the potter wheel and so forth therefore it also arises from something inherently different something totally different from the from the vase from the the pot so therefore it arises from both the same something or itself it arises from itself and something totally different all right okay so those are the philosophical views the refutations hopefully you remember what we went through and of course i don't expect or no one expects you to understand totally what all this means arising especially from something inherently different that's why we have all these these verses that follow from the first verse but before we continue well arising without a cause that's also an important aspect and again um not only do we sometimes have possibly the sense that something arises from itself that in other words the result is already present in the cause we may have that sense we have also of course the sense that phenomena exist inherently and therefore arise from something inherently different but also there are situations when we believe phenomena have no cause i um, mean situations we find ourselves in we can't see a cause and we have a sense, oh, that's just random and there is no cause. In other situations, we may feel, yeah, there's definitely a cause. It's the other person who's to be blamed or whatever we, we consider to be the cause. But there are definitely certain situations we find ourselves in when we also have a sense things don't have a cause, which is impossible, especially in the from a Buddhist point of view where cause and effect are so important that every result hasn't just arisen from one single cause, but from many causes, from an impermanent cause, from a cause that has the potential to give rise to that phenomenon. And of course, not just one cause. Very important, but we, we haven't really uh, discussed this in, in more detail. But to say that it arises without a cause, it's just, it goes against any Buddhist principle. Um, However, there are non-Buddhist schools, the Charakas, for instance, who assert that there are phenomena that arise without a cause. They don't say in general that causes don't exist, but they speak, for instance, of the roundness of peace, of a pea, or the sharpness of a thorn, or the multicolored tail and neck of a peacock. They say that is just so intricate and it's so, I mean, the roundness of a pea, it's so perfect. And, and the sharpness of a thorn, I mean, like who created this? No one, it's just, it's, it's costless. So here, these are the illustrations. Remember, these are the causes, so no causes here. So no causes giving rise to the roundness of a pea, to the sharpness of a thorn, and to the multicolored tail and the neck of a peacock. Okay. But of course, from a Buddhist point of view, no, impossible, as we've just heard. So that is refuted because again, the argument would be anything could just arise like roundness of peace if you don't need a cause then a pea could arise at any time or a mango you wouldn't have to in the in this text it talks about a mango you don't need to wait for the mango to be in season no it would just grow anyway uh, which again doesn't make sense all right so this is the reasoning the first verse that says phenomena cannot arise inherently the way they appear to us as a arisen from an inherent inherently existent cause from an inherently different cause is impossible because that would mean that one of those four extremes arising from itself and so forth would be the case but that's impossible as we've just heard so by way of understanding that none of those four are possible we come to understand that there is no inherently existent cause there's no inherent arising but what we need to understand about these four is that with these four, these four are negative phenomena. When you understand them, you just negate, you negate arising from itself. You negate arising from something inherently different in order to then, of course, eventually negate inherent existence. So no need to go through all the different phenomena. Well, explaining that phenomena, that whatever exists is either a positive phenomenon or a negative phenomenon. And in this case here, the four 
negations arising, not arising from itself and so forth, plus emptiness itself, which is being established on the basis of these four reasons, um, that they are negative phenomena, they're not positive phenomena. Okay, so we went through this, like I said, I gave you this explanation. Well, all the explanation that you find in this little handout is basically what Lama Tsongkhapa also talks about. Uh, and of course, best would be to read Lama Tsongkhapa's commentary, but hopefully it helps a little bit to kind of ease you into the matter because Lama Tsongkhapa's commentary is not easy. Okay. All right. Anyway, so we talked about the fact, therefore, emptiness is a non-affirming negation. So are the, the, four, the four facts, the four... The, the, the diamond sliver reasoning, so the four parts of the diamond sliver reasoning, as it's also called, not, not arisen from itself, not arisen from something inherently different and so forth. So they're all uh, non-affirmative negations. And in this context, yeah, so we discussed negative phenomena, which may be interesting in general, and Lama Tsongkhapa did too, so I mentioned it as well, but no need to go through it. Okay, so that is that. Um, oh, yes. And then one more thing I want to mention. Um, what is important is not just the object, which is the lack of inherent, the lack of objective existence, which hopefully through what we study right now, through what we study, well, uh, based on these verses, we will at some point gain some understanding of and then hopefully deepen that understanding but what is important is to understand the mind itself so what is actually happening when we take emptiness as the object and so in this context the meaning of these three is important being found by reasoning awareness of ultimate analysis being established by such a mind and not withstanding withstanding ultimate analysis because the way to get an understanding of emptiness um, is by looking for that which appears to our mind. And that seems pretty boring. Uh, I mean, it's really hard, first of all, that which appears to our mind, inherent existence, the object that is to be negated. It's really difficult to grasp it. I mean, it's difficult to become aware of how the object appears to our mind. And then to hold on to it and investigate it, uh, I'm sure there initially things that seem more exciting than doing that but there's no way around it to look for it if something appears in such a way if the self for instance i haven't really mentioned the self but it doesn't matter whether we talk about rising whether we talk about a table or whether we talk about the self emptiness applies to all of them but the point is we need to look for that object the way it appears to us as inherently existent, let's see whether we can find it by a reasoning awareness of ultimate analysis. Ultimate analysis in the sense that analyzes not how the, the eye exists conventionally and so forth. No, no, not on the conventional level, but who goes into the, the analysis of what is this eye exactly? If it exists the way it appears, it can only exist among its its aggregates, among the body and the mind. So nowhere else can we look for it. And then to to really take time and search for it. Search for it. Should want to go either in suspend and rising because it's so much, it's too much negation. So to reaffirm, reify again. And we may uh if we if we if we do this too early and we think of dependent arising too early, we think of an inherently dependent arising, an inherently existent dependent arising. So sometimes people ask questions and they ask questions on the basis of a sense that there's an inherently existent dependent arising. And that's when it gets really confusing. So to take the time to analyze, to analyze, can I find it or not? Look for the self, look for the self and stay with that sense of, I couldn't find it. I just couldn't find it. Okay. Anyway, so having talked about this, therefore it cannot be found. The inherently existent self cannot be found by an ultimate analysis. It cannot be established. It cannot be understood 
by a reasoning awareness of ultimate analysis, by a mind that engages in that ultimate analysis, because it cannot be understood, it cannot be cannot be found, it cannot be understood, because it doesn't withstand ultimate analysis. It doesn't withstand ultimate analysis. So something that withstands ultimate analysis, after the analysis is done, you find it. Oh, there it is. But it doesn't withstand it. It's 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 not findable. So therefore, not finding, not being established, not withstanding it, in terms of inherent existence, they mean the same. But if you analyze, if you search for inherent existence, what you find is the non-inherent existence. You do find something, but you find the non-inherent existence of the self, for instance, you establish, you understand the non-inherent existence of the self, but not because you were looking for the emptiness of the self and you found the emptiness of the self. No, 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 no. You were looking for an inherently existent self and found the lack of inherent existence of such a self. And in that way, you found the emptiness of the self, right? Okay. Anyway, we went through it. I hope it's clear. If it's not, you can always send a question to Dalit and ask her, uh, pass, I mean, ask your question. If it's like, go over this again, explain this again. I'll be happy to explain it again next time. But for now, I hope this is clear. Um, so, okay, I made slight changes, but you'll hardly notice uh, the changes I made. All right, so with this, whoops. With this, we're done with the first verse. We're done with the first verse. So the first verse, diamond sliver reasoning. Um, and as I said, we spent, this is just typical for this, the nature of such a text. And the beginning is a lot more explanation. There's a lot more, especially Lama Tsongkhapa's commentary discusses so much in the very beginning. And later on, once we continue with the verses we don't spend that much time on the first verse for instance so the second verse we won't take that long um i've got another two pages prepared and that's it for the second verse and we can move on to the third verse so if you may wonder how many centuries it's going to take us to get through the text <laughs> i don't think it's going to take that long it goes faster as we as we proceed okay Anyway, so let me now go on with the text. Uh, okay, I need to move this over a little bit because I can see your pictures on the side. All right, so having presented now, if we continue, in the first verse, a general refutation of the four extremes of arising by means of the diamond sliver's reasoning, the focus now turns specifically to refuting arising from something different. So something different, of course, as you remember, it means from something objectively different, intrinsically, um, inherently, and so forth, different, independently different. At this point, Nagarjuna does not elaborate on the refutation of the other three extreme positions because they're clearly untenable. It's clearly, it makes sense that there's no arising from itself, that there's no costless arising and so forth. And since the view that things do not arise from intrinsically different causes is more difficult to understand. This is the, the hardest. So of course, it makes sense to go into more detail on this. Okay. So with the second verse of the first chapter of the fundamental wisdom, Nagarjuna presents a Buddhist view that is contrary to the Prasangika Madhyamika view. So here, these four lines now, it's actually those non-Prasangika Buddhist philosophers speaking. Okay. So it's basically in the form of a debate, if you like. So now they're debating uh, with the Prasangikas, which of course uh, is a very popular way of study. It's very good to debate with each other, to, to exchange our views. I mean, we can even debate with ourselves. Okay, Nagarjuna said, the Buddha said, but I think it feels to my mind like this. Okay. Anyway, so here, this is, these are the words basically by these non-Buddhists, um, sorry, no, no, by the non-Prasangika Buddhist philosophers, not non-Buddhists, but Buddhist philosophers, nonetheless, but still not Prasangikas. So what do I say? This is the translation, as you remember, this is always the translation from Ocean of Reasoning. Um, I because I follow Lama Tsongkhapa's commentary and there's only one English translation. So I'm using that as the basis. 
And this is the translation in there. There are four conditions. There's an efficient condition, and similarly, there's the objective condition, immediate condition, and the dominant condition. There's no fifth condition. But I don't know. Personally, I feel there's a different way to read this because it doesn't say condition, first of all, in Tibetan. So more literally, it says there are four conditions, the causal, and similarly, the observed, the immediate, and the dominant. There's no fifth condition. That's quite similar. But I wouldn't call this efficient because it's really causal. It says causal in Tibetan. Uh, the observed, the immediate, and the dominant. There's no fifth condition. All right, so what does this mean? But this verse followers of the Buddhist schools that accept inherent existence reject the refutation of arising from something objectively different. So they reject that refutation from the first verse, arguing that it contradicts the Buddha's teaching. They agree with the other three refutations, of course. And here I'm really quoting uh, the commentaries. It's, it's like... It's, it's not like that difficult, but just to rephrase what the commentary is saying with respect to this. So they agree with the, especially Lama Tsongkhapa, so they agree with the other three refutations. Oh, not just that, also, of course, Chandakirti's clear words, um, which is one of the most important commentaries. It's a, it's a word commentary, as they would say in Tibetan. It's a commentary that explains actually the words of the fundamental wisdom, it goes through all the, the verses and explains what the different terms, what the different verses mean. Uh, but it's a little bit more condensed than, than this material. So it's a little hard. It's not, I don't think it has been translated into English, at least not the entire text. Uh, we've studied one of Chandakirti's commentaries, of course, on this text, on the fundamental wisdom, but entering the middle way, which is not such a literal text. It's less literal. So the literal text, it literally explains the meaning of the fundamental wisdom by Nagarjuna um, is the clear words by Chandakirti, which I'm also basing this explanation on, and Namatsankhapa does as well, of course. Anyway, so what is the, what what is the commentary saying? Yeah, that the 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 non the non prasangika Buddhist philosophers they all say yeah the other ones they they don't make sense the other three ways in which something arises does, doesn't make sense. But they disagree with the Prasangika school refutation of arising from something inherently different. According to them, the Buddha taught that phenomena arise from intrinsically different causes and conditions because in a sutra, the Buddha explains that there are four conditions. There's the causal condition, and similarly, there are the observed condition, the immediately preceding condition, and the dominant condition. There's no fifth condition. So the proponents of the Vaibhashika, Satantrika, Chittamata, and Svatantrika Madhyamika, which are all the other philosophers, all the ones other than the Prasangika, they maintain that the Buddha's words indicate that the four conditions exist objectively and from their own side. So, and that's really what the Buddha also implied when you taught these philosophers. So let's not forget when the Buddha taught the Dharma. He didn't teach it in a, in a, well, I shouldn't say in a not organ, in, a, in, in an un he didn't teach it in an unorganized way. That's not correct. But it wasn't like, oh, today I teach this and tomorrow I teach something else. No, it was always based on whoever the Buddha encountered. So wh whatever was right for the person who had, who had maybe requested a teaching, whoever was in the audience. It was always according to their needs, according to their interests and predispositions. And if lack of inherent existence was too much for them, well, he taught them something slightly different. Not He didn't teach that phenomena lack inherent existence. He implied that they exist inherently, right? I mean, he did not contradict the, the idea of inherent existence, but taught other things that slowly brought them slowly later on when their minds were ripe, when their minds were ready to be taught um, the lack of inherent existence, the Prasangika school. So he just temporarily taught them the Vaibhashika, the Satantrika, and so forth. Okay. So, but therefore, when he gave this explanation, the causal condition, the observed condition, he implied, and that's what was understood, that they exist inherently and objectively. Therefore, that's what they're arguing. You present geekers are saying phenomena don't arise inherently from a cause, 
well, then they don't arise at all. So what about all these causes and conditions, these different causes and conditions mentioned here? That doesn't make sense. So anyway, uh, this is their argument saying the Buddha said, so really this one verse is, re is, is, is citing the Buddha, is quoting the Buddha, describing these four types of conditions um, in order to then say, well, by implication, they exist inherently. So what you were refuting doesn't make sense. Anyway, so regarding the meaning of the four conditions, what are those four conditions? Some Buddhist schools hold that the four are as described in Vasubandhu's treasury of knowledge or Abhidhamma Kosha. Now, this is considered to be a really important text. It is when we study this text. But there's one difficulty as part of this text. I mean, the thing is, when we study the different philosophical schools, what is important to understand is that the texts we study, for instance, the treasury of knowledge, it's actually from the point of view of the Vaibhashika school. It, it sets forth the Vaibhashika school and also the Satantrika. Some parts are explaining the Satantrika uh, by way of negating the Vaibhashika in some places. Uh, but in general, it sets forth the Vaibhashika view. So it's very informative in terms of what the Vaibhashika believes, but it does more than that. It also presents ideas that are not just typical to the Vaibhashika. They're typical to all the schools. So there are certain aspects that are helpful. And we study them because later when we study the other schools, we have a knowledge that helps us to understand the other schools and it's not negated. That's why it's a little complicated. You learn which part you can accept later on and which part not. So it's not like you 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 did, you later on uh, kind of consider that to be uh, consider everything to be invalid because it's from the point of view of the Vaibhashika. No, parts of it can still be accepted. So it's very valuable. And the and Vasubandhu's treasury of knowledge. Sometimes it's described as the study of phenomenology, of different phenomena, this division. I get so many different ways of describing a cause, right? I mean, there are so many different types of causes, and it's good to understand them. What are the different types of causes? It's really interesting, like when we try to understand, for instance, that phenomena are changing. Well, they're changing because they arise from causes and conditions. So in that respect to understand subtle impermanence, it's very helpful to understand that phenomena arise from causes and therefore they change continuously. And not just that, um, also the fact that they can't exist inherently because they depend on causes and conditions, so I can't exist independently and objectively. Um, also in terms of my actions have consequences, what kind of causes are there? Like, well, my experiences from moment to moment, they're the result of my karmic actions in the past. What, what kind of cause is that? So in that way, to get a really good sense of causes and conditions, Vasubandhu's text is great. Of course, we're not studying Vasubandhu's text, but since his explanation of the causes and conditions is really extensive, we look at that. And we learn which part we can take on and which parts we can't. It's not that difficult. There are a few ground rules when it comes to causes and conditions. And when you know these ground rules and you listen to what Vasubandhu says, so you, you, you hear his explanation, you, you, you read his explanation on causes and conditions, you know which part can be accepted, is accepted by the higher schools and which one isn't. So let's see. Anyway, here, four conditions are seen to the, the mentioned as part of the second verse, um, they are accepted to come from by the Vibashi, from the from Vasubandhu's treasury of knowledge and thereby from a text that details the assertions of the Vaibhashika school. Okay, so in the second chapter of the treasury of knowledge, the Abhidhamma Kosha, Vasubandhu explains the four conditions together with the six causes. Okay, so. A little bit more complicated. It's not just four conditions. That's pretty easy. But then six causes. All right. So the six causes are active cause, concurrent cause. Oh, very difficult terminology. But what to do? The Tibetan terminology is difficult. So it becomes difficult here as well. Okay. 
active cause, concurrent cause, homo homogeneous, homogeneous cause. I hope I'm saying it right, homogeneous. Concomitant cause, omnipresent cause, and ripening cause. But it's important to note that according to the Vaibhashika school, some of these causes are characterized as permanent. Okay, so it already takes us in that direction. Now you may think this is so boring. And it may at first hearing this is like, oh, active cause. Okay, I can take that. But the rest, but if you go a little bit, I mean, just as part of the preparation, I, I, I had to get more into the material. And it's really interesting in the sense of thinking of the different varieties, how something arises from certain causes from varieties of different causes and it's important to make those distinctions to get a better sense of cause and effect however they even include permanent things and we do that as well i mean we we may do that as well we may sometimes assert that's something permanent i mean from a buddhist point of view asserting our creator god and asserting a creator god as permanent would be an example of a cause that is permanent for instance or I don't know, we, we hold on to something as permanent, but at the same time, we believe it to be a cause. And again, that would be a problem. So learning about the way the Vaibhashika school sets forth causes is helpful, even though with the wrong assertions, because it helps us to delineate. This is what a cause means, and this is not a cause. And the thing is, when you study Buddhism, it's really important to understand cause and effect for so many reasons. I mentioned already a few, but there cause and effect that will be with you the whole time. Okay. But of course, mainly also to understand the causes of happiness and the causes of suffering to be avoided and so forth. Okay. Anyway, it's important to know that the Vaibhashika schools said some of these causes are asserted as permanent. And some causes, they say, they're, they say that there are some causes that merely, that there are causes because they don't prevent an effect from arising. They say, okay, if something doesn't prevent an effect from arising, it must be its cause. That is too, that is too pervasive, right? I mean, if I don't prevent this, the sunflower seed from arising, the sunflower seed somewhere, I don't know, in France, okay? If I'm here in India and I don't do anything, I don't prevent this, this sunflower seed from becoming a sunflower, I'm technically its cause. That's ludicrous. I'm just not, I'm just no, I'm just not preventing the arising. So that is not enough to be a cause. Permanent doesn't make sense, and merely not preventing an effect doesn't make sense. And existing simultaneously with their results. No way. A cause always precedes a result always precedes a result and that is first when we hear this is like smoke and fire they're cause and effect the smoke of a, of a wood fire is the result of the wood fire the smoke right the smoke the the the, the wood fire smoke is the result of this the the, the the fire but they exist at the same time so no no but that's actually not strictly speaking that's not true because the smoke that exists at the same time as the fire, those two are not cause and effect. But the moment earlier, the moment earlier of the fire that is no longer there now because it's changing all the time, that is the cause of the smoke now. So to put it into philosophical terms, the first moment of the fire is the cause of the first moment of the smoke. So first you have a fire and then a moment later you have smoke. Okay, but never at the same time. So the Second moment of the fire and the first moment of the smoke exist at the same time. Second moment of the fire and the first moment of the smoke, they exist at the same time. So it's really important that distinction, cause and effect can never exist at the same time. Okay, so anyway, that's already gives us a sense. The Vaibhashika school asserts that. Therefore, they're not considered to be actual causes. Some of the Vaibhashika assertions are not considered to be actual causes by the other Buddhist schools, which maintain that a cause must be impermanent, that it must have the potential to actively produce its result, and that a cause and its result cannot exist at the same time. Okay, okay, I didn't want to do more than two pages. All right, 
Let me just read this footnote here. And the thing is, we're not losing track. We're not losing track. We're, we're temporarily discussing causes and conditions according to the Vaibhashika school. Um, just to get a sense of what they talk about. And it's just, like I said, it's just helps us to get a better sense of cause and con causes and conditions, especially of what causes refer to, because by the mistakes, we learn from the mistakes, in other words. And it gives us the opportunity to check, am I holding a view of certain things being permanent as being a cause? Do I hold on to something merely not preventing something else and therefore seeing as not, not preventing the arising of something and therefore considering that to be a cause? And do I consider cause and effect to exist at the same time? So it really deepens our understanding of cause and effect. And that is important, of course, in order to understand the subject matter of this particular chapter, which deals with causes. So in order to negate the inherent existence of causes and the inherent existence of the arising of certain results, we better get a good understanding of cause, of cause and effect in the first place. Because, I mean, if I don't know what a table is, how can I understand the emptiness of the table? Okay. So therefore, before I can understand the ultimate nature of something, I need to know the basis of that something. I need to understand that thoroughly. And it's not just good, of course, in terms of understanding the emptiness of cause and effect, but also conventionally very important. Cause and effect are so important. All right. So before we start the meditation, there's a little footnote. Never mind. I'll do the footnote next time. But just to uh, quickly summarize before we do a short meditation. Does that make sense? We have another uh, 18 minutes, right? Yeah. Okay. Because the timing... Germany was different, so not not yet familiar with the time. Anyway, so just to remember, if we say phenomena lack inherent existence, to really understand that, of course, it's under, important to understand dependent arising. It's important to understand that phenomena exists independence on each other. But existing independence on each other, before they exist, they arise. Before they come, can exist, we need to look at how they come into existence. How does something arise? In terms of impermanent phenomena, of course, and we are, we are mainly concerned with impermanent phenomena, obviously, because there are the objects we're attached to. We're not attached to permanent phenomena. No worries about that. We don't get angry with permanent phenomena. I mean, maybe every now and then someone gets angry with emptiness because it's so hard to understand but really um, in the end we get probably more angry with the explanation with whatever the words that express it etc which is something impermanent so the point is therefore impermanent phenomena so how do they arise how do they come into existence and do they arise inherently what is their relationship to their causes? What makes a cause a cause? What makes a result a result? And of course, the, the remaining verses discuss this in great detail. But to prepare for that, we heard again about the diamond slivers reasoning. If phenomena existed inherently, there are four extremes that would be the case. One of them would be the case. And none of them makes sense. And the most difficult of those is, of course, understanding that phenomena do not arise from something inherently different. Okay, so we'll go more into details on this, on the causes as they're described, first of all, like the uh, non-Prasangika philosophers, Buddhist philosophers who say, no, phenomena exist inherently. They do exist inherently. The Buddha said so. Well, fortunately, in this case, even though the Buddha said so, this is interpretative. It needs to be interpreted. It cannot be taken literally. It was taught for a certain purpose. It served a certain purpose. But actually, it does contradict reasoning. And the reasoning will be presented. But for that, in order to present the reasoning fast, of course, we need to get a better sense of what causes are. And uh, I'll continue with that next time.
with the explanation on the causes as they were given by Vasubandhu. Okay, so now, after this long, long explanation, let's do some meditation. Okay. But before we can dive into it, and of course, as you're familiar with the, the way we've been doing, I'll just repeat it because we had a long break. I'll introduce a topic and you can follow, of course, what I say. But of course, you can also take it from there and, and there's always a little bit time in between. Maybe take it in a different direction if you find there's something else you find interesting in terms of this particular topic. Um, it's totally up to you. These are just guidelines. So to reflect on it as much as you can, use your analytical faculty and don't see it as outside of yourself. The more you have a sense of closeness towards your own situation, to your own daily life. So not distant from yourself, but in terms of your own experience. The closer you bring it, the more effective it is. And as you analyze, it, it should be done with a certain feeling. It's really difficult to explain that feeling, but it shouldn't just be this rational kind of dry analysis, but also touch you in a certain way. Like, uh, I don't know if it's amazement, astonishment, somehow feeling should be involved. But of course, we're not talking about disruptive feelings, unpleasant feelings, but um, yeah, if, if, like I said, a feeling of wonder or a feeling of, oh, this is truly the case, or what does that mean for me personally? So somehow it touches you in a certain way. And that is hopefully the conclusion you come to, which at some point I then say, well, at the end of when time is up, of course, I'll ask you to focus on that, to focus on whichever conclusion you have come to, which hopefully is involved with this kind of feeling, with something, some feeling of being moved at least. Um, and then you focus on that. You allow for this to sink deeper. So that's all I'm saying. Focus on it. But you know that this means you internalize it further. So without having to say all that, um, I wanted to just repeat it one more time so that you are aware of these stages. And you, you should try and do this with all the Buddhist ideas. I mean, to first analyze them and try to invoke a certain feeling. It's like a sense of being moved from deep within. And if you can focus on that feeling then for some time, it'll affect your actions. And that's, of course, the whole point of doing meditation, of transforming our mind and transforming our mind, therefore transforming our actions of our thoughts, of our speech, and of our body. Okay, so enough explanation. Sorry, four more minutes gone. Let's start to meditate. By first just watching the breath, just let it go for any disruptive thoughts. And being focused. So when we reflect on the different aspects discussed today, take a moment to reflect 
What does arising mean to you? What does seizing mean? What does arising from a cause bring to mind? What seems to be the relationship between the cause and the result? Is there a sense that the result may already be present in the cause? Or otherwise, how would you distinguish between a seed that gives rise to an apple tree and a tree that and a seed that gives rise to a pear tree? Where is the potential for an apple tree in the apple seed? Doesn't the cause appear to be inherently different from the result? Don't they seem very concrete? 
the apple seed on one hand and the apple tree on the other. That's inherently different in terms of size, shape, color, and so forth. Maybe it seems both. The apple trees. In the form of a potential already in that seed. Like a concrete and substantial potential. Well, the seed and the apple tree seem to also be inherently different. And not just merely designated. Now there are things that seem to not have a cause at all. Maybe a situation, an experience. I consider a mere coincidence or a mere random situation that has no cost. But of course, if we have that sense, if we have these perceptions of phenomena, then only because we have the root misperception of reality.
fact perceives cause and effect. in a way that contradicts their actual mode of existence as being merely labeled. Potential of a seed is labeled independence on what it gives rise to. And with the seed, as it continuously changes, at some point we no longer call it a seed. But label it sprout and eventually tree. If we weren't to label in such a way, there was no labeling mind, there wouldn't be a seed, there wouldn't be a seedling, and also no tree. But it's exactly because phenomena lack intrinsic and objective existence that we can say they exist. That we can talk conventionally of different conditions and different causes. Performing, performing conventional functions. Causes that are important for us to understand in order to be able to overcome or avoid those causes that lead to unpleasant experiences and cultivate those causes that bring us peace and satisfaction.
So now to conclude this short analysis, take a moment to single-pointedly focus on whatever insight, whatever conclusion you've come to. And then let's take a moment to dedicate. Having meditated on emptiness, on the ultimate nature of phenomena. May that become one of the many causes we have to accumulate to become fully enlightened. So that we are of the greatest benefit, not just to ourselves, but also to all sentient beings who are helplessly trapped in their misperceptions and the resulting afflictions. May our study and contemplation of this text also cause the lives of our lamas, like his homeless the Dalai Lama, to be very long and healthy so that they'll continue to teach us through their examples and through their words. And lastly, may whatever positive potential we've accumulated together have a positive impact on our environment right here and now. Help those who have physical ailments get better soon, like Geshe Punso, Tali Lubin, and everyone else suffering physically, but also mentally. May help us to be a good example to others already right now. And then let's dedicate with the words, of course, while reflecting on what I just said. Through the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful, generosity, Denzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the precious Bodhi might not yet born arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. Okay. All right, so thank you. As I said, if you have any questions, you can send them to Dalit. Um, and uh, I guess that's it. So we continue with the text next time and hopefully there won't be any longer breaks. Um, I mean, my apologies, I forgot to mention that, but yeah, I had to get a few things sorted out and now I, I'm Hopefully we can continue and it won't take forever to go through all the verses. Okay, so have a good evening or whatever 
to the time where you're right now. Have a good day and see you next week. Bye. Thank you, Kishima. Thank you, Dalit. Thank you, Kishima. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Geshima. Thank you, Dalit. See you.